Well, good morning, Oak Grove. Uh, I am Pastor Jim, and I am privileged to be here with you today. Thank you to you all for welcoming me and to Pastor Amanda for uh, inviting me to be here. Um, I'll give a, a little bit more. Uh, I am a retired pastor. Uh, I didn't start out that way, <laughs> either retired or a pastor, that is, you know. Uh, and I'll tell you a, a secret that I wasn't going to tell, but that I've told a few people anyway. Uh, I am from Long Island, New York. Um, I don't sound like I'm from Long Island, New York, uh, except when I get angry <laughs> at my kids or grandkids or um, get sloppy. I'll say, close that door and give me some coffee and stuff like that. But uh, I was a speech major and a disc jockey when I was in college and trained myself to develop a mid-American accent so no one knows exactly where I'm from. They know I'm not from here. Notice I hear, you know, all right. But, uh, but every once in a while, it will creep out. Uh, I grew up in Long Island, New York, and then went off to, to Marshall University. Anyone heard of Marshall? No one? Okay, a couple people. And uh, if anyone go to Marshall here? <sighs> I was hoping. I was there, uh, 1970 was my freshman year, uh, the year of the plane crash uh, that uh, killed uh, our football team and everyone on board that plane. Uh, prior to that, I'd gone into the Coast Guard. And uh, Coasties, any Coasties here? <sighs> Again, I'm striking out all over the place. Uh, but anyway, I served in the Coast Guard, and then dropped in the reserve, went to college, and was called into ministry. I did not start in the church. I'll get to that later. And uh, wound up being a pastor, and I pastored for uh, 33 years. I retired out of the Coast Guard in 1998, out of the reserve program and then retired as a pastor. And uh, then I got a wild hair when I had hair. Uh, and at the age of 57 and 10 months old, I decided to graduate the Virginia Beach Sheriff's Academy and became a deputy sheriff with 20 and 30 year olds. And they were like, what in the world are you doing here? I said, oh, I thought I'd have some fun, you know. So I did that for a few years, and then I retired, and a couple years later, uh, I was, or two years after, or two weeks, actually, after I retired, uh, the FBI contacted me. No, I'm not an FBI agent, but I'm the chaplain for the uh, Norfolk Field Office of the FBI right down the road here. So I, I come down this area all the time. I've been in this church uh, a couple times, never had the opportunity to share with you but I thank you for inviting me to be here and allowing me and Pastor Amanda for allowing me to share. I'd like to share two passages of scripture. The first one comes from Amos, the fifth chapter. Amos writes, and these are God speaking through him, I hate I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. No, no, no comment about what you all were doing. Okay. Uh, away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Then from the Gospel of Matthew. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? 
They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God, he is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrite. Isaiah is right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen and understand. What goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but whatever comes out of his mouth, that is what makes him unclean unclean. Then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? This is the word of God for the people of God. I do not know whether it's a true story or not, but I read about a young girl who for years had watched as her mother was preparing a roast. And she would cut off a little slice on this end and a little slice off this end of the roast before she put it in the oven. She had seen this so many times and uh, never knew why. So she asked her, finally, she asked her mother, Mom, why do you cut a little piece off of each end of the roast before you put it in the oven? And her mom thought a second and said, well, I don't know, but that's what my mother always used to do. Why don't you ask your grandmother? So she called up her grandmother and said, Grandma, uh, Mom told me to give you a call because every time you cut a, make a roast, you cut a piece off of this end and then cut a piece off that end. Why do you do that? And her grandmother said, well, I don't know. But my mother used to do that. Why don't you call your great-grandmother? Her great-grandmother lived in a retirement community. She called her great-grandmother and said, great-grandma, I have a question. When you bake a roast, put a, a roast in the oven, you, you always cut off one piece from this end and another piece from the other end. Why is that? And the great-grandmother said, well, you see, when I first got married, we had a very small oven, and the pot roast didn't fit in the oven unless I cut the ends off. Sometimes we follow traditions, family traditions, because they're family traditions, you know? Uh, I'm sure many of you have had family traditions, things that you did in your family and still do and may not understand why you do that. I know when I was growing up in New York, my mother would always cook a birthday dinner for whatever that person you, you wanted. And my choice was always scalloped ham and potatoes with cream spinach. Now, I don't know whether you like that stuff. That's my favorite birthday dinner. My dad would have been 96 years old last Sunday. My dad loved Chinese food, and for his birthday, he always went and got Chinese food. So last, last Sunday, I went out and I got shrimp egg foo young and a shrimp egg roll, 
And he, my dad loved the dessert. And uh, I, my daughter-in-law was going to bring over a piece of turtle pie, which was my dad's favorite. Traditions are great because they help us uh, to recall who we are and where we came from. But sometimes traditions get in the way of us being knowing whose we are and where we are going. The church has many traditions, some things we do, and no one knows why we do it. Every church I've pastored, and that was 33 years, every church I pastored always had communion on the first Sunday of the month. Is that what you all do here? Mm, yeah, some, yeah. You know what communion is, you know, it's, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, d does anyone know why we do that? Why we have communion on the first Sunday of the month? I don't either. I don't either. I'm wondering whether it's because back in the olden days, the circuit riders would have to make a circuit and never always never got to the same place, same church every week. And so maybe that's where it came from. I don't know. I did not grow up in the United Methodist Church. In fact, I was an agnostic atheist growing up. My family are non-practicing Ukrainian Jews. Ah, don't ask how I became a United Methodist. <laughs> I married an Irish, Italian, Polish, Catholic girl from Long Island. I guess you take a Ukrainian Jew and, and, a, and you put him, that's what you get. I don't know. I don't know. But one church I was pastoring, and again, don't forget, I wasn't raised in the church. I'm serving communion. People are putting money on the communion rail. I'm going, is that a tip for me? Yeah, is this how they pay me? I don't know. I'd never seen that before. And later on, I came to understand it was that was an offering for the poor to help people who came uh, to the church who were looking for assistance. I didn't know that. Nobody explained that to me. Traditions are great, but sometimes they can get in the way. The Book of Discipline, those of you who are lifelong United Methodists, maybe understand what the Book of Discipline is. It says, within Methodism, we believe that the living core of the Christian faith is revealed in Scripture, illumined by tradition, vivified by personal experience, and confirmed by reason, with tradition providing both a source and a measure of authentic Christian witness, although its authority derives from the faithfulness to the biblical message. Traditions are great because they help us to recall who we are and where we came from. But traditions sometimes get in the way of whose we are and where we are going. See, one time Jesus took, was with his followers and they were walking through a field and they were hungry. They were getting hangry. And they reached over and they broke some of the heads off the grain and they ate it. See, in Jewish tradition, they used to leave a portion of the field there for anyone who came through who was hungry to feel free to take some of the food. The only problem is the disciples did that on the Sabbath when you weren't supposed to work. Now, the Pharisees were like any religious denomination. They did their best to interpret and make relevant the laws of God for their time. 
If you remember, after being oppressed by the Egyptians for over 400 years, God had Moses go up on a mountain. And he came down from the mountain carrying 10 commandments. Anyone want to try to name them? Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> if you would ask me, I'd go, uh, let me see, don't park in the sign that's, no, uh, no, that's not one. The first four commandments were to teach us how to live with a sense of identity and purpose as God's people. The other six were to teach us how to live and to love our neighbor. They were all given to help us to recall who we are and where we came from. But see, as time went on, they added laws. And then they added sub-laws. And then they added sub-sub-laws. And then they kept on going. And by the time they finished, the Talmud, which helps to explain the laws and interpret the laws and provide clarification of the laws, came to 6,000 pages. And Moses had 10 commandments, and they had 6,000 pages. I don't know about you. That's not bedtime reading for me. Traditions sometimes get in the way of whose we are and where we are going. Jesus said to the Pharisees, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people and not the people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Traditions get in the way sometimes of us doing the will of God. We can do a lot of rituals. But sometimes they have no internal effect. And that's why Amos wrote, I hate and I despise your festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Whew. Even though you bring burnt offerings, I won't take them. If our tradition is not pushing us to love God and to love and to serve people, it's an empty ritual, and we need to question why we're doing it. If our tradition is not bringing us closer to God and empowering us to be Christ in our community here at Oak Grove, in this area of Great Bridge, in the places where we work and live or go to school or socialize, we need to question why. We need to untangle Jesus from religion. We need to realize that our way of doing things, our tradition, may be hindering us from becoming whose we are and where we are headed, where we are going. Now, how many of you, I know I talked to a couple, how many of you know who Michael Slaughter is? Mike Slaughter. Uh, one out there. If you get a chance sometime, uh, I encourage you to read some of Mike's books. Mike was pastor of Gingsburg United Methodist Church in Tip City, Ohio. He uh, retired after, I don't know, 30 some odd years at that church um, and now s continues to speak. Uh, Mike and I were seminary classmates together uh, at Asbury Seminary. He wrote a book called Revolutionary Kingdom Following the Rebel Jesus. And this is what Mike said. We are experiencing a growing tide of nationalism. By the way, this was written five, six years ago, or published five, six years ago. We are experiencing a growing tide of nationalism, and with it, a spirit of isolationism throughout the world. Not just out here, but throughout the world. In our own country, a nationalistic zeal is promoting the attitude of country first, country forever. 
Our borders start becoming sacrosanct and outsiders become suspicious, something to be feared. Jesus' disciples were accused of making, were guilty of making the same assumption many Christians throughout the centuries have made. Even after his miraculous resurrection, they went to Jesus and dared ask him, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were looking for a political savior who would make Israel great again. Jesus' response was, it's not for you to know the time, the date, the hour when God will set his own time frame by his authority. Rather, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and throughout the ends of the earth. Then he says, the cross, the cross, not the flag, should be at the center of our Christian identity and worship. As followers of the rebel Jesus, we are a kingdom people the earliest Christian creed, Jesus is Lord, had lethal ramifications for those who followed and accepted Jesus' call to follow the cross. They refused to acknowledge Caesar as Lord. We must always see Jesus' kingdom of God movement, Mike says, in prophetic tension with the empire of nation state. The gospel of the rebel Jesus moves beyond nationalistic favoritism to global redemption. I'd like Brian to share a very short clip. Uh, how many of you have heard of the comedian Michael Jr.? Oh, that's another one you're gonna have to look up. Look up Mike Slaughter, look up Michael Jr., YouTube him. Black Christian comedian, absolutely funny. This is a very short clip. Go ahead, Brian. Also found out when Jesus was 12 years old, Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. They lost Jesus. And you know the first thing they had to do was pray. I wonder what that prayer must have sounded like. Joseph probably did the prayer. He was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> Dear God, um, oh, forgiving God. Um, you remember that Messiah you gave us? You got another one somewhere, man? We don't... That was the only begotten son? Okay, we're going to find him. We're going to find him. <laughs> also found out when Jesus... How is it that they lost track of Jesus? How could, how could he have gotten that far away from them? How was it that they could get so wrapped up in their traditions for Passover or whatever it was to lose Jesus. I'm wondering how many of us, in the busyness of life, taking the kids to soccer or baseball, I see your soccer uniform. Let me see, who do you play for? Beach FC? My granddaughter plays for Beach FC too. Fishing or golfing or whatever, get so caught up in those that we lose Jesus. I, I wonder how many of us, with the busyness of life and holidays and traditions, have lost Jesus or maybe uh, mixed Jesus up with uh, church. Uh, in case you didn't know, Jesus and the church are different, okay? 
I mean, we come to church to worship Jesus, but, but they're not the same thing. Or, or, or maybe Jesus and country. Now, let me say, I am a patriot. I have retired from the military. And when the national anthem is played, I stand at attention. When I go to a parade and there's a, a color guard coming by, I stand and I salute. I love this country. But the traditions of the country may conflict at times with what Jesus is calling us to do. Somehow, within the church, we have sometimes lost Jesus, or at least we've gotten Jesus tangled up with religion, or, and that religion tradition becomes more important than Jesus. U2 singer uh, Bono said, religion is what happens when the Spirit has left the building. William Willimon and uh, Stanley Hauerwas wrote a book uh, in 2012 titled Hijacked, Responding to the Partisan Church Divide. He sa they said, we would like a church that again asserts that God, not nations, rules the world, that the boundaries of God's kingdom transcend those of Caesar, that the main political task of the church is the formation of people who see clearly the cost of discipleship and are willing to pay the price. Somehow or another, the original ideas, well, I didn't say ideas, okay, ideas of Jesus and the ways of Jesus got lost, got tangled up, in the human desire for uh, power and control. Are there times in, in our journey, in your journey, your faith journey, where you may have left Jesus behind? Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that uh, you lost Jesus on purpose or uh, that you totally forgot about Jesus. But consider whether you have made sure that he is on the journey with you, your faith journey with you. When he was 88 years old, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes was traveling on a train. The conductor came by to collect the tickets. Uh, I used to ride with my grandfather, who was a an engineer on the Long Island Railroad for 49 years, and he let me pull the whistle as we went through some of the stops. And uh, the, condu the conductor was coming through collecting tickets, and Oliver Wendell Holmes was searching all over, could not find his ticket. The conductor was very sympathetic, and he said, uh, don't worry, Mr. Holmes, uh, we know who you are. The Pennsylvania Railroad will be happy to trust you when you reach your destination, you'll probably find your ticket, and you can just mail it back to us. The conductor's kindness did not put uh, Mr. Holmes at ease, and he said, my, my dear man, my problem is not where is my ticket, but where am I going? In the cycles of life, we can feel like we are traveling without rest, go from season to season, holiday to holiday, tradition to tradition, and sometimes have to wonder, where are we going? I hope that you encounter Jesus along the way. If you haven't right away, that's okay. No worse in the care of Jesus than Joseph and Mary were. And as parents of the Son of God, Mary and Joseph went about a task that God had charged them with. They found him. And it may be that as we receive that which others do for us, that we find Jesus responding to the needs in our life. 
if we are constantly busy doing things for God, we cannot assume that we'll automatically be able to encounter Jesus in what we're doing. I pray Jesus will be there when he's needed most, but if he's not, but if he's working through us for others, it may be that they will be more likely to recognize Jesus in us than us. We may need to look at our life. Is Jesus on the journey with us? Have we brought Jesus along with us? Or have we left him behind because we're so involved in our traditions? I pray you've not lost Jesus. But if you have or if you do, know that Jesus' arms are always open wide always there, ready to come back and say, hey, take me along with you on the journey. Not too late. Got sidetracked a bit, but that's okay. You're back. Let us pray. Jesus, we recognize that at times we're so busy with our own lives that we don't notice that you've escaped our attention. Sometimes we've placed our traditions or moral or political inclinations ahead of you. Help us to search for you in places where you have the space to make your wisdom and understanding known to us in the presence of God the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.